I am Dr. Derek Lee. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Selby, complex pediatric and adult spine surgeon at Adelaide Spine and Brain Clinic in Australia. Welcome, Dr. Selby. Thank you, Derek. Great to be here. All right. I'd like to go back a little bit in your history and your training. And I notice, with myself being a Canadian as well, that you spent some time with a fellowship at, uh, Vancouver, in Vancouver, Canada at the British Columbia Children's Hospital and also the Vancouver General Hospital for Adult Spine Surgery for Fellowship Training. Uh, what was your thought process in specializing in both pediatric and adult spine surgery and why did you travel to Vancouver? Yeah, so um, I think a lot of Australian surgeons, uh, I'd selfishly say our quality of training here is fairly high, um, very similar to Canada and the US. Um, we actually uh, take a little bit longer a lot of the time to get through our training. And so most of the surgeons uh, uh, at the end of our training have got uh, you know, five to six years of re residency under their belt. Um, uh, but we still like to get an international perspective or at least a different perspective on our training. A lot of our training is very uh, uh, regional based. And so we go to a number of hospitals in our region. But I think it's also good to uh, get a bit of experience uh, elsewhere that you can bring back home and uh, share knowledge and uh, skills from around the world. So I suppose that's the general principle. Uh, one of the reasons I chose particularly BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver uh, was that they do a high volume of uh, pediatric uh, scoliosis and adolescent scoliosis surgery uh, and had some really good surgeons there that were highly recommended to me. Um, and it was a it was a great experience. Uh, no one hospital in Australia does the volume of cases that they do and uh, uh, it was a really good uh, time there. Um, when I was there at that point, um, most of the work was fusion-based work. Um, the, uh, the work with uh, VBT that's been done in that center since, which is excellent work, uh, hadn't yet started. Um, and that's probably a reflection of my age more than anything else. But uh, <laughs> um, it, uh, uh, it was a, a very, very good experience and something I've been uh, able to bring back here, a lot of uh, things I learned there. Very good. Well, it does seem to be a bit of an Australian tradition for a bit of a walkabout. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. and I, I do run into quite a few Australians in Canada that are in the process of doing that. Just a world experience, right? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we, we get stuck in that little corner of the world and we haven't got a big population, but we're a big country in terms of land mass. And, uh, and we do like to get out and uh, see how uh, the Northern Hemisphere in particular does things. So, yeah. Very good. Um, since your training there was pre-VBT, uh, where, where was your first experience and exposure to that form of um, non-fusion surgery? Uh, look, I've been uh, traveling regularly in and out of the US over the last 10 years and, and Canada. Um, and you, you see at meetings, um, surgeons doing this kind of work. Uh, and uh, I think um, I was impressed by uh, some of the early work, particularly by uh, Dr. Randy Randall Betts, uh, and Dr. Peter Newton, uh, and there's been a lot of uh, talk at the meetings on this technique and technology going forward. Um, a lot of the training that I did, I'm fortunate enough in, uh, in Australia to be trained in anterior spinal surgery myself, and so a lot of the work we do is, is without an access surgeon, or we only use an access surgeon for potentially very difficult cases. So we actually do a lot of this exposure work ourselves, both in uh, thoracic and uh, lumbar work, uh, both for adolescent or pediatric cases, but also dominantly for adult cases. And I think that's been um, uh, relatively a uh, straightforward transition for me to go from putting screws and cages in for adult fusion type procedures to using the same approach to putting in screws for VBT or ASC type work. Um, the big difference uh, is, uh, I find, is actually um, the indications for uh, the procedure. And it's because we really don't have a huge volume of data on uh, exactly what levels to do for a particular type of curve. So how many vertebrae to include, uh, whether to include one or both curves in the initial surgery for VBTs. So there's a lot of uh, unknowns still uh, out there. Um, I have gone, uh, I was lucky enough to go and see uh, uh, Dr. Betts and Dr. Antonacci uh, in Madrid. And uh, that was a, a few years ago. And uh, Dr. Betts actually uh, came down to Adelaide, South Australia to help me with the uh, first few cases. So it was very good of him. And that was pre-COVID, uh, sort of destroying those uh, opportunities for travel. But it was, uh, it's been a, a good learning curve and experience for me. I, I think, as I said, I'm fairly comfortable with the placement of the implants and actual technical aspects of the operation. But uh, 
I always send my cases uh, to my colleagues overseas for uh, opinions if there's any doubt about the levels or whether to do one or both curves and uh, seek advice. And it's a great community out there. And uh, you've met, you've already interviewed some of the uh, great people that helped me out. So <laughs> I have continued to be amazed at the camaraderie and the close knit nature of, uh, especially the pediatric spine surgeons, in terms of you know their willingness to uh, collaborate. It's, it's very impressive. It's also interesting that uh, in Australia you, you were taught uh, very much the anterior approach because it seems that um, in North America even maybe less than 5% of um, spine surgeons actually know any kind of anterior approach or they have to get an access surgeon, maybe a little bit more in Europe uh, where it has been more popular, especially with anterior fusions. I was wondering technically if you can I assume you do both uh, because you do ASC and BBT. You do uh, both a thoracoscopic approach and a mini open approach for the thoracic yeah. region. Then you do a mini open for the lumbar. Is that correct? So I was uh, uh, trained in thoracoscopic surgery at the BC Children's Hospital where they had two excellent surgeons. Um, uh, I have found though that even for um, VBT, I'm more comfortable with the mini open uh, for the even the thoracic and certainly the lumbar is always mini open and I've made a few modifications to that based on my uh, adult fusion experience doing minimally invasive lateral fusions in particular. Um, the I will use the scope at the top and bottom, but I still do the mini open around the apex of the curve uh, for the uh, thoracic approach. Uh, just with the way um, the tension and uh, getting the tension on the apex with the VBT uh, technique uh, and uh, trying to get a little bit of derotation, I find better with that mini open technique. But I think that's a, a real unknown and a, a, it depends on where your skills uh, come from and how comfortable you are with thoracoscopic work. And, and I wouldn't say I'm a high volume thoracoscopic surgeon. And so I think that those who are, uh, are very uh, capable and good at doing it that way but I've just felt that you can get a little bit of derotation, particularly with ASC, but also with VBT, and perhaps you can do that a little better through the apex of the curve with that mini open approach. Why is why are you allowed to do more of a derotation with the mini open and the ASC? Is it um, because uh, well the incision's a bit long? Well, it is longer, and it gives you more yeah. room to maneuver. Correct, and it gives you a bit more room to get these uh, towers on that go on the top of the uh, screw and uh, basically manipulate it before you lock it off. What determines whether or not um, you use a thoracoscopic approach versus a mini open approach, or is the vast majority more of a mini open regardless? Yeah, the vast majority for me is mini open, but I use a thoracoscopic port uh, at the top and bottom. Okay. Um, That's a common. I'm trying to find out if there's any kind of um, long-term issues with lung deflation with either approach. Is there? Any documentation with respect to that? Yeah, so I think uh, even when you look at fusion data, there often is a subtle decrease in uh, lung function um, due to a, a lack of um, a movement in the chest wall. Essentially, our, our ribs and vertebra join together. And when you fuse a long segment of the spine, you do see subtle reductions in, compared to a completely normal population. But it's probably still better than untreated scoliosis. So that's got to be your comparator. Right. Um, and I, again, I, I think there are some subtle reductions in uh, lung function um, seen, but they're not what we call clinically significant reductions. And uh, I know there's a little bit of presented data out there um, from uh, some of the originating surgeons, I call them in the US, that's fairly encouraging in that regard. Um, yeah, I, I've also um, seen that uh, some patients, uh, small publications, but some patients traveling to Europe for surgery are actually having both surgeries done in relatively uh, short succession, uh, which would involve deflation of lung potentially on both sides. And those patients seem to be recovering fairly well and able to get home quickly without major complications. So you know, it's encouraging, but we're not gonna know for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's the long short of it. Um, uh, uh, you'd hope that there aren't gonna be major problems, but uh, I think the unknown in this is potentially the tether material. Um, uh, I think screws are fairly inert in there uh, and you don't get any 
uh, metallosis because you don't have metal rubbing on metal. You've got the tether, which is a, a rope type of device um, uh, that is uh, uh, there. Now, if the tether breaks, theoretically, the ends of it could irritate some of the local structures. Okay. Uh, and uh, But again, I think that's unknown. Absolutely. Um, in terms of instrumentation, are you currently using Globus, uh, Zimmer? Uh, yeah, I currently use Globus. Zimmer is, uh, is just becoming available in Australia now. Globus have been the longest in Australia. Uh, prior to that, I, uh, prior to the availability of these uh, specific implants, I, I hadn't tried to uh, uh, make it work with something commercially available for adult spine surgery, which is how this all originated. Uh, you have some vast experience with both uh, complex spine surgery and in pediatrics and adults. What was your motivation in terms of trying uh, training and developing your skills in terms of uh, tethering technique and non-fusion uh, scoliosis surgery? So uh, luckily enough in, uh, in my area of Australia, South Australia, we, do, uh, we don't have a population that's very, I suppose, mobile uh, for a lot of people who live here and stay here. I mean, there's a little bit of people moving away and other things, but a lot of patients here um, do stick around. And, and part of that is probably a bit of our tertiary education system in that, uh, unlike uh, US and Canada, or even the UK, uh, people don't move around as much for university tertiary education, and they often stay closer to their home, and then they end up working closer to their home. So uh, we, I see a lot of long-term follow-up patients, essentially, and uh, I didn't operate on uh, all of them. I've been a consultant or attending for 10 years now, um, but I, I did notice that a lot of patients, particularly with long fusions, were running into major trouble in their late 20s, early 30s. Yeah, you know, no difficulties with things like uh, chronic lower back pain, um, and that's due to a combination of disc degeneration and facet joint changes, facet joints being the small joints in the back of the spine that work with the disc to provide mobility. And uh, look, I, I think when we're doing, say, if I take a step back and say, well, my orthopedic surgery training was in uh, arthroplasty as, and joints, which I, I don't do anymore, but when we look at joint replacement outcomes, we're looking 10 years minimum uh, as to say this is a successful result or not. And you know, we're, we're hoping our joint replacements go for 15 to 20 years. Now, this is a much younger population. We're doing fusions as the primary treatment when recommended for this group. And I'm seeing a number of patients coming back at that 10 to 15 year period with trouble. Speaking of that, that's a great segue because I know you do have some case studies you'd uh, well, hopefully you'd like to share with us. Yeah, I do. I do. I've just got a few I'll go through. Is that okay? That'd be awesome. Thank you. So my son was in a Shakespeare play last night. So uh, my title is to fuse or not to fuse. That is the question. Uh, and it remains a question uh, that is unanswered. Um, I do work at Adelaide Spine and Brain, but uh, also run the, a group called the South Australian Scoliosis Service, where we integrate uh, bracing, exercise, um, and really uh, everything we can to avoid surgery uh, before considering the options. So this is another of uh, the practices that I, I work through. Um, Derek, this is a 17-year-old patient of mine who uh, came to me with an idiopathic scoliosis. She'd been managed uh, for a few years uh, elsewhere, um, and she had quite significant lower back pain. Um, the diagnosis was idiopathic scoliosis, but this patient does have, have ligamentous laxity, which means the old double-jointed, um, uh, which is really common, I find, in, in patients with scoliosis. You know, it's not universal, but idiopathic scoliosis is commonly associated with some ligamentous laxity. Um, and uh, there's a mechanism there that probably needs to be better defined. We still don't know the cause. Um, if you look at her starting x-rays uh, on the screen, um, you can see she's got about a 45 degree curve, but the L45 level, so the very lowest disc, uh, not the lowest, second lowest disc there is quite tilted. And she'd already got some early wear and tear change on that disc from really not having a curve treated a little bit earlier. And, and that was a challenging problem. Um, so she ended up having a, a relatively long fusion uh, to L5 for this problem. And on the right of screen are her x-rays at two years postoperatively, where she'd actually made quite good progress. And she had a standard posterior fusion-based procedure with me. Um, then we go to five years post-op. And on the left of screen is an EOS scan. We got a modern x-ray machine finally in Adelaide, South Australia. And just at the bottom of those x-rays, you can see there's a subtle problem that she's actually broken a screw. Uh, 
within the fusion construct. And you can see that better if you go to the right of screen, there's a, a halo, so some loosening around that screw there, and it's actually snapped within the pedicle. And the joints just above it haven't fused, so everything else is stable, but the lowest level of fusion, L45, has not fused. And this has only manifested itself almost five years after the initial surgery. So these screws and rods are incredibly strong and will hold on for a long time, even if the bones don't fully fuse or join. Also, in addition to that, she has a second problem, which you can see on the MRI scan, which is a uh, second to the middle from the right there. She's got an MRI looking down the spine like it's a tube, and probably the more obvious one is the side-on view of the spine. And you can see at the base there, a disc protrusion in the actual spine itself, uh, in the L5S1, heading towards the spinal nerves. And that's a reflection of the disc degeneration or wear and tear on that disc. And now we're remembering this patient is only 22 years of age. She's five years after surgery. So this is fairly significant problem at, at this stage. And um, to address that, uh, I ended up performing a minimally invasive lateral fusion, um, which you can see that cage device there at L45. And I actually put some small fusion cages in the back as well, all through a series of very small incisions to try to get that level solid. And then we're going to have to come back and address the uh, disc protrusion um, later. And it's a really difficult question as to what to do for that. And I've shown this case to a number of colleagues and no one has a perfect answer as to what to do for this otherwise fit, active and wonderful young lady. So this is a real challenge and um, she's my patient and it's something that uh, I really want to try to get right for her this time. Um, so a reflection of... Um, fusion data, and this is a paper, and you, some of these names on this paper you might recognize, Derek, because you've interviewed a few of them. Um, but this is from uh, a, a big study group in the United States, which has, and Canada, um, which has what I consider to be uh, uh, many of the world's most outstanding surgeons. And if you look at the major complication rate requiring further surgery, two years or more after surgery, it's about a one in 25 rate, so 4%. So that's not small. That's one in 25 kids having fusions with amongst the best in the world are needing more surgery around two to two years and beyond after the operation. And what this data probably doesn't capture is those 10 to 15 year outcomes that we're after. So when people say fusion is a known commodity, uh, I'm not sure about that statement. I, I don't think that we have an absolute heap of long-term data on particularly modern fusion techniques and modern fusion patients to be an absolute direct comparator to VBT. That's my personal opinion. So when we look, this is another quick case, a 30-year-old patient who was 15 years after fusion, age 15. As you can see, the CT scan, which is the left part of that picture, she's got thoracic implants in. She had those taken out for pain. Her lumbar implants were left in. Um, she developed severe lower back pain. Um, and you can see on the very right there, she's got an MRI with two-level disc degeneration. And this is a further MRI here on the right of screen. And at the back of the spine there, she's got quite significant facet degeneration and really two-level disc degeneration. And you know, one of the, the key questions of a young lady in her 30s is about pregnancy and, and potential complications associated with that. And again, Dr. Larson, who we'd mentioned briefly previously, and Dr. Shah um, have got a paper on this saying that if you finish your fusion, uh, particularly to L3 or L4, and particularly L4, uh, you can run into real trouble with uh, the uh, pregnancy process in terms of back pain and discomfort uh, during that process. And so these are really important questions that I don't think are completely resolved or answered yet. And some of these uh, cases uh, have led me really away from fusion and down a path of VBT and ASC to try to preserve the motion where we can. This young lady was struggling so much and we tried injections, physical therapy, all sorts of other treatments. We ended up performing a procedure called peripheral neuromodulation on her, which is a very straightforward basic procedure. May not be something you've touched on yet in your uh, interviews, but uh, this is a, a basically a battery on wires that goes in the um, spine and the paraspinal uh, area to distract the way the brain receives the pain. That is all it does. It is a very simple device. It can be removed in, it's put in in 25 minutes, removed in 10 minutes. But 
um, she's done really well with this over the past 12 months or so and being able to work and study and, and do exercise. Uh, and the other alternative for this patient would be to fuse the L45, L5S1 discs and extend the fusion down to the pelvic bone, which you know, for someone in their mid thirties contemplating pregnancies and, uh, uh, and a fit and active professional, otherwise it's not, not ideal. Put a lot of pressure on the hip joints uh, going into the future and increase the risk of needing a hip replacement early in life. So these are all really important decisions that we're making. And uh, uh, this is another case to me that uh, just tipped me towards looking more at the, uh, the non-fusion options. Derek, if you'd like, I've got a, a quick uh, case to run down. I can be really quick on just how I do the minimally invasive approach for the number. Absolutely, and you don't have to be quick. Please yeah, take your okay. time. <laughs> no worries. So I did want to bring this up because it's not all bad news. Um, this was a, a paper from, uh, uh, from Hokkaido in Japan, uh, published a couple of years ago in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, so a very good journal. And uh, they looked here at anterior spinal fusions for lumbar scoliosis. And they've actually got amazing follow-up in this study. It's only a small group of patients, around 30 but they've got 17 year follow-up on average for these patients. They had really good results. So you know, this is a, um, uh, a paper where they did have some disc degeneration, but really uh, very, very good results overall. But when you dig down into it, most of their fusions performed for this patient group, they finished their fusion at L2 or L3. And what that means is that there's at least, if you finish at L3, you've got at least three mobile lumbar discs sharing the load of day-to-day -day life. And I, I think also these fusions with the anterior fusions are shorter segment a lot of the time. And so there is not a, as much what I call fusion burden above the lumbar discs. So it's important to remember that these, the patients in this study were a very small group of patients with many lumbar curves, having only very short segment fusions done. And I think overall, you look at these results, you go, they're actually pretty good. So it's not all bad for fusion. That's good. So this is a, a patient of mine um, who actually has Marfan syndrome. So he's not idiopathic scoliosis, but he's got a rapidly progressive curve. He was 16, he was still growing, Sanders 5 and Rissa 1. He's got something called duralectasia on his MRI scan, which is basically where the space available for the uh, spinal um, nerves expands and uh, the fluid expands and it actually makes the bones, particularly the pedicles, which we use to put screws in for posterior surgery, it makes them a lot thinner, makes it a very challenging surgery, even with modern navigation and modern um, screw-based systems. So that presents particular challenges for a posterior approach. And he had very small pedicles, which is the bony channels we put those screws in around the middle of that curve. So actually getting a good correction on this patient is potentially challenging, but he had a very flexible curve and that's his uh, hand X-ray there. So he did have significant growth remaining, but he wasn't inside the traditional uh, VBT uh, parameters being usually Sanders two to four graded on the hand X-ray of growth. He was a Sanders five, but I still thought he had significant growth remaining. And there's been some recent publications which suggest perhaps waiting until that four to six Sanders range may actually be okay still, particularly for the lumbar curves. Um, there's certainly a downside to solid fusion in patients with Marfans. They're probably at the most extreme end of that potential ligamentous laxity that we see uh, in patients with other patients, including idiopathic scoliosis patients. And a lot of Marfans patients do end up with uh, junctional issues because their spine is naturally hypermobile and flexible. So when you put a solid fusion in the middle of that naturally hypermobile spine, of course, you get quite dramatic changes potentially above and below that fusion. And so there's definitely a higher risk of, uh, of uh, fusion related complications in Marfans. And so uh, quite justifiably, the family and the patient had some concerns about this, as did I actually thought um, this young man was a good candidate for a, a minimally invasive VBT. So this is what we do. Um, we go in, uh, we use very small incisions. You can see that's about a three and a half centimeter incision in the side, um, ably assisted there by uh, my uh, resident, Dr. Cantor, who's gonna become a spine surgeon. He's just finished his final exams. Um, we uh, basically go through the anterior part of the psoas muscle when we do this. So you peel the muscle back a bit, but you have to actually go through some of the muscle fibers and uh, place a, um, the screws under what's called neuromonitoring. And so we're monitoring the nerves that run out of the spine through the psoas muscle and down into the leg at all times during this procedure. 
And so this is done using a, a lateral uh, minimally invasive retractor, um, neuromonitoring, as I mentioned, and the transverse approach. And then you can use a similar approach uh, for the upper screws in the low thoracic region. Uh, and you can sometimes, particularly T12 uh, and sometimes even T11, actually reflect what's called the pleura. Uh, and although you're in the rib cavity, you've actually got still a protective barrier between yourself and the lung. You don't need to deflate the lung some of these lumbar curve operations, which reduces the amount of time in hospital, reduces the need for a chest drain. And so there are all sorts of good things about that. Dr. Selby, can I ask you a couple of questions? Of course. When you go through the psoas, um, with the trans psoas approach, um, yep. oftentimes you'll find that patients who have undergone you know, tethering in the lumbar area have quite a bit of psoas discomfort or issues down uh, or pain, maybe nerve pain down the leg or even yeah. parasympathetic uh, differences in terms of, um, you know, hot, cold, uh, numbness, perhaps, that type of thing. Can you talk a little bit more about those complications? Absolutely. And so uh, it, it's something I warn all patients about before doing this. And when we do the monitoring for these nerves, um, we're monitoring the main motor nerves. And so we're monitoring the, the big nerves that come out of the spine through what's called the lumbar plexus, which is within the psoas. And they go down into the leg. Our ability to monitor the smaller um, cutaneous or sensory nerves and the sympathetic nerves is fairly limited. You can get some monitoring on those. Um, but the simple reality is that um, you can disrupt those pathways. Now, the good thing is having done uh, hundreds, if not thousands of these in adults, is that I know the vast majority, even in adults who don't heal as well, resolve within six to 12 weeks. You know, they get better most of the time. Um, there will still be a few patients with uh, sympathetic issues long-term, um, sympathetic nervous system issues. But uh, I think that, can occur no matter whether you do a mini open approach and peel the psoas back uh, or whether you go a little bit trans psoas. And, and actually I find going trans psoas through the anterior one third of it where the lumbar plexus almost never lies. And we studied the MRI beforehand just to make sure that that's the case. But just by gently splitting the muscle there, I, I really found that um, I got less uh, dysesthesia, which is the nerve symptoms in the thigh than going and peeling the psoas back for a long period of time, basically putting it under retractors. So it's a work in progress, <laughs> but uh, as to uh, uh, exactly how many patients have it, and, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, give you some data on that after we've done a few more cases. Excellent. And just as a follow-up, in terms of when you access the uh, uh, lumbar area, is the hmm. cut the cutoff for the diaphragm. Uh, so how, how many levels can you actually approach below the diaphragm as opposed to having to go to into the chest for a thoracic approach? Yeah, so it's highly variable, but um, most of the time I can get to L1 um, without going into the chest cavity, um, just as long as the ribs are fairly mobile. Uh, and very rarely I can get to T12, uh, but Often T12, you can go above the diaphragm, but you can still potentially be retropleural. Uh, it's a tricky exposure, but uh, and not for everyone, but you can actually, with the uh, uh, minimally invasive retractor systems we have, uh, sometimes access that space safely. And uh, it's what I often aim to do is to stay actually out of the pleural space or the lung cavity altogether. Sure. And I think that reduces potential problems, but uh, because it, the individual patient anatomy is quite variable. And um, ultimately, uh, it's a decision that we often have to make on the operating table after discussion with the patient and their family beforehand about the fact they may need a chest tube and they may not. Very good, thank you. No worries. This is just a little video. Just checking the uh, motor potentials there and this is displacement of screws. Just checking on x-ray where the line is. Just fast forward a little bit. This is just feeling for where the uh, 
Pedicles, and here, here's the screw being placed through the small retractor. So through an incision about that size, I can usually do about two to three screws or two to three levels. So some patients with short curves will get away with only two, three and a half centimeter incisions. This was his immediate post-op, uh, and uh, so already uh, quite dramatically improved in terms of the curve and, and still getting the muscle balance back. And he's been doing uh, exercises uh, back home. And I actually just saw him the other day for his six month follow-up and he's looking even better, really well balanced. So for me, if this result continues, that's an ideal result for a, a kid with a, a pretty big curve uh, with Marfan syndrome. So high risk of fusion related complications, including junctional kyphosis. And uh, I think uh, it's a, that's an ideal outcome to me. Is L4 basically the lowest vertebra you can tether to, or is L5 available sometimes? <laughs> um, L5 is available, uh, but um, transoas is a bad idea at L5 uh, because of the position of the uh, blood vessels. And so that would require a, a mini open incision. Um, but there is actually a, a lot of, uh, again, adult fusion-based technology to access that through an oblique incision. So you can keep the patient in the same position and access the side of the vertebra through an oblique incision using very similar retractors to what I, I demonstrated there. Um, I haven't yet gone to L5. I may well have to, but I haven't yet. So, um, but theoretically could be done. Okay, um, quick question. I know most surgeons try to, when, did, in, when you uh, apply to other tension, they tend to start at the apex and then work their mm -hmm. way um, above and below. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they also try to uh, line up the disc as much as possible. Is that the same uh, methodology you use as well? Yeah, it is. It's the same methodology I use, although um, just to not over tension the top one, often I will do the top first just lightly, and then I'll come back and do the apex. Since we were talking about a tether, and I know you're using the Globus system, I know that last year um, Globus was supposed to be rolling out a bit of a new thicker tether, perhaps. Have you heard any mm. news about that? Not yet, no. Um, but uh, I, I'm not uh, closely involved with R&D in that area, so um, it may well be on the way. I, think, uh, the, uh, I, I did ask um, uh, some of the uh, uh, pioneers and originators as to why they didn't put a tiny metal filament in the tether to see whether we could see if it was broken or not, because <laughs> I think that's useful information. But because um, often you can still have a successful outcome for the patient with a broken tether because it's done its job, uh, you know, maybe it would just create unnecessary anxiety. I don't know. But I, I, to me, if we're trying to prove a new technique works, I would like to know for sure whether something is still intact or not. And so I'm hopeful that maybe in the future, we'll at least have a, a surgeon option of choosing a tether uh, that has a little filament wire in it so we can completely tell if it's broken or not. Now, yeah. you do the ASC. I guess, you know, VBT is kind of a terminology used for uh, immature spines, for telling immature yeah. spines. ASC is a little bit more for mature spines, but you can, you can do it for any age group. In terms of more mature spines, one of the controversies around tethering is, you know, how long would the tether hold? Uh, what happens if the tether breaks uh, prematurely, maybe one or two years out? Do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, look, I think um, the more mature spines, uh, I think a double tether is, is helpful and protective. Um, and uh, that's the ASC type technique. Uh, within the, the lumbar spine, when doing that, I would only ever, um, uh, use the double tether um, rather than using uh, disc releases, which is part of the technique in the thoracic spine. I think once you start doing that in the lumbar spine, you're probably going to end in those discs fusing. Um, if you look at uh, studies on uh, animals, uh, animal models for fusion, uh, one way we create disc degeneration. So I've been doing this in the lab 15 years ago. Uh, we, we would deliberately put a, a blade into the disc of a, of a sheep and we MRI'd the sheep before and after and uh, six weeks after deliberately just cutting into the side of the disc of a sheep, it would have disc degeneration. 
And then we'd use that model to, uh, to uh, either do fusions or at that time we were also investigating things you could inject into discs that might actually help. And you know, all that research has really amounted to not very much over the years, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> uh, we're still a long way off solving uh, degenerative disc disease. And, um, uh, but it was interesting that that model, so I very much respect the work that's been done in ASC about incising into the discs in the thoracic region. Uh, I think it's necessary to take the tension off the tether um, if you're dealing with bigger curves in particular. I'm not completely convinced that those discs will not autofuse with the passage of time. And so patients with an ASC may end up with a few segments across the apex where they've had um, their thoracic disc released, fusing with the passage of time. How much that matters, I'm not sure. Why are you more comfortable doing a disc release uh, in the thoracic spine with thoracic discs versus the lumbar? Um, because we rely far less on our thoracic spine for day-to-day -day motion. And so an incidental autofusion there to me is if it does occur, and we're not sure about that, um, but if an incidental autofusion does occur, there's probably no clinical significance to the patient. Oh, I just, it's interesting to note that when you look at a large segment of adult patients like I do and their scans, how many patients have an almost ankylosed or very stiff thoracic spine by the time they're in their late 50s, early 60s anyway. Uh, a lot of patients get big uh, osteophyte formation, which is uh, bone spurs essentially that almost fuse the uh, thoracic disc. It's incredibly common. Okay. And much less um, incidence of pain in the thoracic area as well with uh, yeah. this fusion and osteophyte formation. Correct. And, and I think that's a reflection of the uh, uh, natural lack of motion in that area that we have compared to the lumbar spine. And now, the stabilizing effect of the rib cage and sternum as well. Absolutely, much more of a rigid structure. Um, disc release seems to mean a different, have a different definition depending on the surgeon, uh, yeah. so, right? It's it's a general term. Yeah, it's like pizza, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you have an authentic Italian or uh, American stuff, <laughs> right? Or pineapple on your pizza, Canadian stuff. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so I know for some surgeons, when they do a disc release, they might do a, disc re uh, a small incision on the, uh, on the convex side of the apex. And I know, I believe with Dr. Antonacci, Dr. Betts, they'll do a little bit more of a, uh, a longer disc release, um, not necessarily on this convex side, but the anterior side perhaps. And they also um, incise the anterior longitudinal ligament to free it up even more. Is that the particular style you, which, what's your definition of disc release? Like, it's probably so an easier being, question to ask. Uh, <laughs> being trained by uh, Dr. Betts, uh, that is my definition of a disc release. Um, and you know, uh, we've had frank discussions about what we think will happen and uh, in the future. And, and I know that they are doing uh, long-term or medium-term at least research work on that at the moment. and. Uh, uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see what happens because, as I said, my, my basic science uh, prior experience suggests, in, at least in animal models, that that extent of release may result in uh, disc degeneration and then subsequent autofusion of the disc. Um, that can happen, but uh, whether it happens in adults, I'm uh, well in mature, skeletally mature humans. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's one of those unknowns, Derek. Yes, that's that's life. Now with, uh, I know Dr. Betts, uh, I believe he prefers also to um, remove the, the nucleus of the disc as well. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a little bit, not, uh, not the whole thing. Okay. Because yeah. sometimes some of it protrudes anyway, I guess, in terms of yeah. decision. Okay. Yeah. I actually, um, a lot of these patients are not large patients. And so actually getting access into that disc space, um, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not very hard, but it's, I wouldn't say it's easy access either. It's not like a lumbar disc. To do a nice release actually takes some time. Now, the, uh, of course, the sagittal curve is quite important because it seems that um, it seems that sagittal curve dysfunction or misalignment is what drives scoliosis in the first place. Do you mm -hmm. find that um, the disc release in a thoracic area tends to, be, in, I guess in general, um, in the thoracic, if we talk about a thoracic area and scoliosis, you have more of a kyphosis, hypokyphosis, sorry, and oftentimes a lower doses. Do you find that the disc release is pretty critical in reestablishing some sort of kyphosis in the thoracic region? 
Um, I think it's helpful, but uh, I think if a spine is still fairly flexible, then um, you can maybe get away without it um, because of the, the nature of the tether acting or the ASC acting on the anterior column. Uh, but I, I think if you've got a, an established or stiffer curve, then it certainly is going to be helpful. And it's going to vary. Um, when I, I talk to patients about this, it's a decision you almost have to make when they're relaxed under anesthesia on the operating table. There are obviously extreme cases, really big curves, very challenging curves, um, uh, which uh, you'd be committed to doing that from the start. But it's, the, it's a decision that I tend to make on a case-by-case -case basis. I haven't got much more of my, my presentation, Derek, but this is just another case, just to show the difference with um, that you can do the same technique with two screws. And so this is a more recent case, uh, which is in evolution still, uh, a young patient, again, quite a flexible patient, but idiopathic scoliosis with a, a primary lumbar curve, which is flexible, but a secondary thoracic curve. And the primary lumbar curve was measuring approximately 52 degrees, and thoracic curve about 42 degrees. Uh, and at the moment, we've chosen to, she's a little more mature patient, we've chosen to do a, a, a ASC type technique or double tether technique, but no disc releases um, to the uh, L4 vertebra. And I've only used one screw in the 11 to allow me to come back and do the upper curve if I have to. Um, a little more room in the vertebral body there. Um, we're waiting to see. Uh, this is one of the issues to me with uh, the technique and technology is that I think if I'd done a fusion for this patient, I would be uh, about 92% um, confident to 95% confident that we could probably leave the upper curve, but I wouldn't be completely confident. Uh, but with the tether, I'm not sure, and uh, or the, the ASC. So this is one that uh, as a surgeon who... Uh, as I said, is comfortable with the technical aspects, but still refining indications. I'd love to see more data on, <laughs> basically. Good question. If um, a more mature patient has signs of um, disc degeneration, yes, would that would that disqualify that patient from a tether technique, or did the disc that, have to be that, pretty pristine? That is a brilliant question, and uh, I think that answer is unknown, uh, but you're where we may look at a tether in the older patient would be if they're getting disc degeneration at the base of the spine. So what you find with scoliosis is there's two areas of disc degeneration that tend to occur. One is around the apex of the curve. So around where the spine is most sort of displaced to one side or the other. Um, at the other is at the, uh, the, the base at L45 and L5S1. And part of that goes back to some old um, uh, biomechanical data that discs under what's called shear, so um, sort of shear force, uh, don't do as well as normally loaded discs. And um, you often see, particularly L45, a degree of uh, shear occurring uh, as it's the, uh, the tilted end of the, uh, of the scoliosis or the curve in the spine. So it really depends on where the disc degeneration is. And if there's disc degeneration in the middle of the curve, then I would be a bit hesitant about offering um, ASC type techniques, uh, but it is a, up for discussion with any individual patient. Um, and again, there is not enough data on skeletally mature patients to guide us in that decision. Um, that's a very individual, uh, intuitive decision that would have to be made. I think if you're looking at early disc degeneration at L45 and L5S1 in particular, in a more skeletally mature um, uh, adolescent or a young adult that has, hasn't had treatment, but still has a flexible curve, that to me may be a very good indication to consider ASC because you're trying to preserve those discs trying to unload them, get the shear force off them, and uh, hopefully avoid a fusion to the pelvis in the future. Dr. Selby, what are your parameters for uh, immature and mature spines in terms of curve, curve angle, uh, bob angle, I should say, um, yeah. uh, type of curves? <laughs> I'll let you take that. Uh, so uh, Dr. Per uh, Trobush uh, uh, has uh, heavily influenced me on this. He's a uh, been a, a great source of, source of advice for me in the past. And uh, I fairly much use the parameters um, that he's used and published. Um, uh, you know, over 60 degrees, um, I, I've been around that, but I'm not, I wouldn't push really beyond 65 to 70 at this point. Um, something that I'd be prepared to consider, but uh, 
uh, it's not something that I've been, uh, I've got any regular experience with. Um, uh, I, I like to see flexible curves. I like to see a curve that will bend below 50% uh, of its original um, uh, uh, magnitude. Uh, but again, bending x-rays can be a little bit um, inaccurate at times. And, and occasionally, if a patient is on the borderline, we'll do what's called attraction under general anesthetic x-ray. So uh, that's where uh, we actually give a very brief anesthetic or sedation, relax the muscles, and uh, a little bit of gentle traction um, of the spine and get an x-ray and see what happens, because that more accurately reflects what's likely to happen to the patient under anesthesia at the time of surgery. I find that can be a useful adjunct. Uh, but really thoracic uh, 20 up to, uh, sorry, thoracic curves between uh, 40 and um, uh, mid 60s would be uh, that are still flexible and lumbar curves from really 35 up to again, mid 60s, often the lumbar curves tend to be much more flexible than thoracic curves, which is a big advantage. Do you have a kind of a age limit to your, your more mature spines that you would consider? Um, or does it depend on the health of the spine and the flexibility? Yeah. It depends on the flexibility and it would depend on the disc status. Uh, and uh, again, I'd be anxious uh, um, if there was extensive uh, degenerative change at the apex in particular. In general, do you have an idea of how many tethers you've done? over? The, over at, I'm, I don't know how long you've been doing the tethering for. So I've only been doing tethering since uh, late 2019 when... Uh, when Dr. Betts came uh, to uh, Adelaide, South Australia. Um, and uh, look, over that period of time, I've been doing about one per month, um, you know, just gradually building uh, practice. Um, so I, I don't have a huge data set to tell you what happens to everyone. And, uh, but it is something that I collaborate with my colleagues about. I'm always looking at, uh, at what they're doing, at new data that's coming out uh, and uh, really trying to seek advice uh, to work out level selection and appropriateness of patients for this type of treatment. Very good. But I am enthusiastic for it. I can tell. I can tell you that, um, and most of these examples, well, all these examples are in the lumbar spine. Do you find that uh, ASC, VBT has the greatest potential in the lumbar spine in terms of sparing yeah. motion? So in terms of uh, my thoughts, um, they probably reflect thoughts that maybe some others have given you as well. I, I am not completely convinced that thoracic VBT is going to be better than fusion, but it may well be. If we can get the thoracic VBT reoperation rate down to four to 5%, that two year to four year mark, like that paper I, I showed before, then it becomes a great operation to me and we should be using that as our first line. Where fusion stops at uh, T12 or L1, and there's still a lot of mobile discs left, um, my feeling is that most patients will still do very well with that. Uh, when we are looking at these longer fusions, stopping at L3, L4, L5, that's where I feel really strongly that VBT and ASC has a major role in preventing fusion-related complications going into the future. So if you see a patient presenting with, um, uh, you know, alternatively fusing into L3, L4, mm -hmm. you're, you're automatically thinking uh, tethering might be a better approach sometimes, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, that's changed. I mean, I, I was not thinking that three to four years ago. I guess one of the limitations of uh, the tethering or one of the concerns about tethering is um, tether uh, breakage. Hopefully, well, there, it, new tether tech is coming out uh, hopefully soon. The tether, the length, the, how long it will last, you know, if it lasts 15 years, that would go a long ways yeah. in changing um, surgeon's perspective on using this technique for more mature spines. Look, I think it might. And uh, I think that's where um, we need to look at uh, you know, what's happening underneath all this. Because I think if we're asking the tether in an ASC type technique with two tethers to do all the work forever, it's probably gonna break at some point. You know, no matter how strong you make it, it's still probably in the lumbar spine, at least gonna break at some point. Now, the question is though, before it's broken, will it have forced enough remodeling of the bone, um, which is constantly, our bone is not a static sort of thing that sits there like uh, the, um, 
you know, the uh, steak bone you might throw to your dog. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's a living tissue that's constantly evolving and turning over. And if you change the load on that bone uh, by doing uh, tethering uh, or uh, ASC operation, so the, you know, the ASC principle is that you can actually get the bone to remodel and there's some potential remodeling in the disc as well that might occur. Absolutely, and that'll hold if a if a tether manages yeah. to hold maybe yeah. three or four years or such a thing. And again, to my point on putting a little wire on it, mm -hmm. is that what we could then see is that um, if we put a little wire, we might see it become the wire becoming loose rather than breaking. And then we know that remodeling is happening. We know actually if the tether is becoming loose, so we see the wire buckling a bit that it's doing its job and that the remodeling is occurring and that the chance of late failure almost becomes irrelevant then because the spine is remodeled and the driving force for the scoliosis has been addressed. Well, that's an excellent point because I really hadn't even thought of uh, the uh, tether slackening over time after the original correction if, if it doesn't need to do the work anymore. And mm -hmm. like you mentioned, having you know, a uh, wire filament that would show up on x-ray would be pretty straightforward, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll keep asking. <laughs> Please do. I'll send this interview to uh, Globus and Zimmer. Um. <laughs> Excellent. If you look into your um, uh, crystal ball, and I know you're very enthusiastic about uh, ASC, what do you see happening in maybe five, 10, 15 years in terms of, uh, um, scoliosis, uh, surgery, um, the future of non-fusion surgery, that type of thing. Yeah, um, look, uh, first thing is that uh, uh, I think in about five years time, we're gonna have a, a lot of good data on at least VBT um, and its medium term results. And there are a lot of really good surgeons uh, with good data collection facilities that have enrolled patients in long-term follow-up studies. So we're going to start to see sort of more true proof of concept. And uh, you know, I think the FDA approval in the US has been wonderful. And so we're going to get a lot of good data on that group of patients who are eligible for VBT. That's the first thing to say. Second thing is that um, I think the uh, technology and the tether itself, the screws will improve. You know, and uh, you've alluded to that previously. And I, I'm not... Um, uh, involved in that development work myself at the moment, but I'll be watching the space very closely. And uh, you know, when you're making a tether, the balance will be between something that's too rigid, uh, particularly for a double technique, uh, versus uh, uh, something that's not going to uh, uh, break prematurely before it's done its job. So, and that's again a real balance. It's going to take some time to work that out. Um, I think again, as we get uh, better at the surgery, we'll be able to do it through smaller and smaller cuts. Uh, we'll be able to uh, perhaps uh, look at um, sparing uh, some of those uh, nerves uh, through either mini open or uh, minimally invasive approaches in the lumbar curves uh, and not getting those sensory troubles. And I've actually seen some recent technology um, using intraoperative ultrasound to identify nerves. Uh, that was pretty cool. I'm hoping to try that soon. Uh, so there are always these incremental improvements. Uh, and you know, I think for kids affected by scoliosis, the other thing is, well, idiopathic scoliosis is the primary use of uh, non-fusion techniques at the moment, but we will be able to roll that out to kids with other problems. The next future of, uh, of uh, tethering or non-fusion techniques to me personally is kyphosis. So, you know, there's, there's kids with scoliosis and there's kids with kyphosis, there's kids or abnormal kyphosis and there's kids with both. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about the sagittal profile and you obviously know a lot about that already, but you, you look at a, a kid still growing with say what's called Schumann's kyphosis, which is probably the subject of a whole separate talk, but again, affects teenagers, uh, can be uh, painful, can be quite uh, disfiguring. I've had kids with Schumann's uh, not being able to go to school because of teasing for 18 months. They had their surgery, went back in six weeks. You know, but that is still a long fusion operation. Now, Sherman's is a disturbance of growth of the growth plate uh, in the growing spine. It causes the vertebra to wedge. Can we address that with tethering, but at the back of the spine? And this is a, a, another thought of mine is that will we now move to uh, 
to dealing with kyphosis through uh, non-fusion techniques. And uh, I think that that's something that uh, I'm hopeful, again, with the stronger tethers, we may be able to look at. Yeah, sort of posterior tethering, absolutely. Yeah. With uh, kyphosis and scoliosis, because I, I was always under the impression that um, you needed, and I, I was speaking to Dr. Uh, Rene Castellan, and from the Netherlands about um, the ideology of scoliosis and how even with kyphosis, um, there are at least a couple levels of vertebrae that are, are hyperkyphotic. Mm-hmm. And hyperkyphotic, the hyperkyphosis and of course the segment rotation leads to the, the coronal uh, curve production. How does it work with kyphosis and scoliosis? Because it seems to be the opposite type of um, sagittal alignment issue. Yeah, and I think that's where um, you have to look at the potential etiology. And and most patients with kyphosis and scoliosis have a different driving force. And so, for example, in Sherman's disease, the primary problem is within the growth plates of the vertebra, um, which may also be an issue in AS, but a different problem. But it causes wedging of the vertebra. And that wedging can be asymmetrical and that drives the scoliosis, but the primary problem is the kyphosis. Whereas in idiopathic scoliosis, uh, they are completely, you're completely correct. Majority of patients have a a lack of normal kyphosis or hypokyphosis uh, that that needs to be addressed, which is very well addressed with an anterior compressive technique to restore that kyphosis, which is essentially what the tether or ASC is. uh, the combination is where we're going to run into challenging cases. And, you know, there, there are certainly for, for very challenging cases, the, the option of doing a hybrid. You could do short segment fusion and tethers below or tethers above. Well, that's who you are, right? Complex spine surgeon. Yeah. Exactly. I think you like the more difficult the case you like, you enjoy it. <laughs> um, yes, yes and no. I like fixing complex problems when I can. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Dr. Selby, thank you so much for um, giving up your time for the interview. I, I learned a lot. I really appreciate that. And um, do you have any uh, final words? Oh, I've just stopped screen sharing, Derek. I'm just going to, um, you know, my final word would uh, only be to say to, uh, to Derek, thank you very much for doing this series. I've watched a number of your videos. I found them uh, highly informative. Uh, I very much hope patients, their families, uh, other healthcare providers uh, and uh, and uh, specialists uh, have a chance to watch them. Uh, it's just a, a great perspective. You've interviewed uh, surgeons with a, a vast knowledge and experience more than mine, um, and uh, I found it uh, incredibly uh, uh, valuable. But it's also humbling to be invited on. And thank you very much. My pleasure. Terrific. Enjoy the rest of your day in um, Australia. It looks like you have a beautiful day out there. And it's been raining a bit, mate, but oh, it? uh, it's, not too, it's not Canadian weather here. Let's put it this way. A, a cold, wet day in Adelaide is still about 10 degrees Celsius uh, and no snow. Uh, and uh, you don't really even need Nova jackets. So, yeah. I have to visit one day. When I get down okay. there, I'll, I'll have to say hi to you. We have better coffee, I can tell you that. <laughs> <Believe it. laughs> not, not, snow is not as good. <laughs> anyway. I'll trade right. the snow for your coffee any day. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Derek. See you, mate. Bye-bye. Bye for now.